Hey folks, it's your pal Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com, here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. This is a weekly show broadcast live 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Times on Sundays in which I use steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master to prepare for my regular D&D game. In this case, I am running the hardback book of adventures called Ghosts of Saltmarsh. This show is brought to you uh, by the fine backers of Sly Flourish at Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash Sly Flourish, you too can aid the Sly Flourish empire in helping to pay for the infrastructure to keep up all of these shows and the website and uh, the new newsletter. Uh, I, I, Because of the fine backers of Patreon, I was able to afford to uh, pick up a uh, system to handle the newsletter. So now there's a Sly Flourish newsletter. You can see it in the show notes. I don't think it's in the show notes yet, but I'll put it in the show notes. It's in the show notes for YouTube. I know that, but maybe not for Twitch. Uh, so you can sign up for the newsletter and you will get the weekly Sly Flourish article sent straight to your inbox every Monday morning. So uh, that is thanks to the backers of Patreon. So we just finished chapter eight of Ghosts of Saltmarsh, which was the styes. Uh, good morning, Wonder, and good morning, He's Not Your Problem. Always great to see you guys. So we just, yeah, so last session was our final session of the styes. So while I've been running through Ghosts of Saltmarsh, uh, after we finished the final enemy, there are only two adventures left, and that is Tomarot's Fate and the Styes. And I chose to let the characters pick which one they wanted to do first. So I had sort of a central theme that existed between both of those adventures, which was the rise of Tharzadun and the, uh, the rift that's growing in the bottom of the ocean. So there's a, the rise of the cult of Tharzadun in the styes and the rift that's opening up in the ocean and the characters decide the players decided let's go after the corruption in the styes first so they headed that way and then, interestingly enough i offered that both i offered that choice to both my wednesday group and my sunday group both of which are playing ghost of salt marsh and both of which are at roughly the same place and both of them chose to go to the styes so that was particularly interesting so in last session's game uh, they they had so they had gone to the styes. They had crawled through. They killed Mister Dory. They fought a whole ton of uh, uh, pirate type people that were turning into sea spawns. They um, went down. They found the the ancient temple to Tharzadun, which exists underneath the styes. They fought. They they found a dead abolith uh, who told them about how another one of the Aboleth's partners had betrayed them and became a priest of Tharzadun, an Abolithic priest of Tharzadun named Sogoth. And the session began last week with them facing Sogoth. And in this, uh, in this, in this epic battle, they fought Sogoth, the Aboleth, plus four Chules, which was a deadly encounter and turned out to be, in fact, deadly. So the battle started off, it was, it, it's, it's kind of fun to start with a set piece battle, particularly when it fits well into the story that's going on. So they, they walked into the chamber and they knew it was there. I knew we were gonna have a big layout. I set up a nice two tiered Dwarven Forge arrangement, really kind of neat with cliffs and walls and all kinds of pretty stuff. And uh, they, I'm looking to see if I have a picture of it, but I don't have a picture of it handy. So. Uh, it started off with the Chules, right? It started off with they saw, who did they see? Oh, they saw one of their shipmates uh, was, was sitting there who had been captured by the, uh, by the Cult of Tharzadun and was slowly being converted into one of the sea spawns by the Aboleth. So he was right there and they're like, okay, we got to go deal with him. And they ended up like lassoing him and they cast uh, Lesser Restoration on him, which got rid of his charm and everything. He's like, what the hell's going on? And that's when the walls ripped open and four chules came out. These great big monstrous crab-like creatures with poison tentacles for their mouths. And they attacked. And turn one was the uh, monk of our group uh, whose name, uh, names are terrible, I'm terrible with names. Uh, Dave, the Triton monk, uh, ran up to the first one, punched him, stunned him with stunning strike ran to the second one, punched him, stunned him with stunning strike, ran to the third, punched him, but the, uh, the Chul succeeded on the, on the save and was not stunned. So he stunned two of the four Chuls in turn one. And I don't think the Chuls had a particularly good initiative. I think, they, I, I, think I went with static initiative, which was like a, you know, for them was like a 10 or maybe an 11. And so most of the group, I think, got to go beforehand, and they started just wailing on the Chuls. 
And um, they took one of, they didn't kill one of them, but they severely damaged one of them uh, by the time the Chules went. And then the Chules started running around grabbing, grabbing them and poisoning them. And I made one mistake. I mean, I, I make mistakes all the time, but I made one particular mistake in this circumstance, which was, let's go pull up a Chule here. Uh, Chules are fun monsters, by the way. I like them. Uh, they're big meaty monsters challenge rating four they look cool so yeah 93 hit points so they weren't able to kill one outright but they almost did i mean they, they really hurt it and i don't think i increased the hit points in these i left them at their 93 hit points which is probably correct and so i made the mistake of thinking that a creature who was grabbed by the pincer of a chul was also restrained so that put the characters at a disadvantage because i was grabbing and restraining them instead of just grabbing them the tentacles, however, um, yeah, so a neat, a neat little trick with the chul from a tactic-y, tactical -y standpoint is that the chul can make a multi-attack, makes two pincer attacks. If the chul is grappling a creature, the chul can also use its tentacles once. I presume that means it can grab someone on one of those attacks, and now the creature is grabbed, and then it can also do its tentacles. So it can theoretically hit with a pincer attack, and if it hits, it grapples automatically. And if it's grappling, then it can hit tentacles, which means you're going to be taking two solid hits, 22 points of damage each, plus or 22 points of damage per both attacks, like 11 points of damage each, and then tentacles. And the tentacles are really bad because they paralyze a target, which means now the Chul can do critical hits against them repeatedly, right? Because they paralyze target, uh, if I recall. Uh, where is it? Paralyzed target is incapacitated, can't move or speak, automatically fails strength of decks, attack rolls have advantage. Any attack that hits a creature is a critical hit if the creature is within five, within five feet. So that's pretty bad to get. Uh, and you got four of those guys. So when the Chul started hitting people, that, that's when things started hurt. Meanwhile, in the pool, the, there was this huge, um, huge swirling uh, storm in the, in the pool that was a mixture of a control water and a spirit guardians and the aboleth rose up from this and started trying to charm people and it charmed the fighter corvel who's brutal okay corvel is the one that's just he's a regular 40 damage around kind of guy and when it charmed corvel everyone's like oh my god we're in we're in serious we got we got big problems and he missed like every attack so while it ate up his attacks it he missed almost all of them so it really didn't do a whole lot and then i think he they broke him out of it with damage i think he he took some damage and broke out of it and then the the abolith charmed someone else and that person was running around so it was definitely a lot of that and so while they had a really good first round with all the stunning and all the beating of the tools once the tools were no longer stunned and once the abolith was in play they, they had a, a big, you know, a lot of problems. So Dave, the monk, thought, I'm going to run in there and try to stun the Abolith. Now, you know, my Abolith has legendary resistance, so they're never really going to stun it. But he's like, well, yeah, but I got a lot of stunning strikes. I'll burn through it eventually. So he jumps in there, but he immediately has to, like, fight his way through the control water. Then he's taking Spirit Guardian damage. And then he's, then he's, um, uh, he takes Spirit Guardian damage, and then he goes and attacks the, the, the Aboleth, and I think he missed. And the Aboleth then started beating the hell out of him with tentacles, like three tentacle attacks. Aboleths have, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not nothing up close. Um, and he went down. So he was, he was next to the Aboleth and unconscious. Uh, look at Aboleth here. Yeah, it started tail swiping him as a legendary action. Uh, it was also doing the psychic drain. Um, uh, what did I do? I didn't do the psychic drain. I think I did something else where he was. Oh, I guess it was the legendary, uh, the, the the lair actions. I was having him do the lair action where uh, you know, energy is getting conducted and everybody's taking damage from that. So everybody took damage from crazy necrotic energy flowing through the, the whole place. And he... Uh, I forgot to do the mucus clod too. That's unfortunate. Maybe I should go back and, and maybe then maybe Dave's got that problem. So if you can already breathe underwater. Anyway, uh, so it was tail swiping him and then it hit him with, I think he gets three tentacle attacks, makes three tentacle attacks, right? Each one is 12 points of damage and you know become diseased. So plus nine to hit. So it ripped Dave up and Dave was unconscious. And I think 
it killed Dave. I think it ripped him in half. He got ripped in half. I think, yeah, it happened a little bit later. So Dave, who stunned everybody, um, ended up getting killed. And then another character got hit by a chul, and it hit him when he was down, and he had already failed a death save. So he took two failed death saves then, and he died too. And now everyone's like, oh, my God. Like, they already had, like, two chuls down. But they still had the Aboleth and the other Chul. And then uh, one of the characters, I think it was um, Mac, cast Control Water and pulled the Aboleth out of the pool and threw it on the ground right next to them. And now it's flopping around on the ground like a great big fish. And they, uh, and then <laughs> Corvel went over with his oar, Thorzadun, and started beating it with the oar, which I thought was hysterical because it's like they were fishing, right? It's like they fished the Aboleth out of the water and it hits the deck and then they slam on it until it's dead. And that's what they did. And so in his very last thing, when it was dying, uh, once it was dying, it cried out this terrible psychic scream and everybody heard it and it you know, caused madness or something. I don't know if I did, I did a madness check, but it definitely like was bad. And they heard something reply to it. And that's when they felt the whole cave starting to rumble. The water started pouring in. They're like, what is going on? And as they finished off the Aboleth, and I think at that point the Chules fled, well, the remaining Chules fled, they left the cove and they went up and saw that the uh, Black Death, the great whale out on the horizon, is smashing, uh, smashing the styes to, 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 to tinder. That it just just was destroying it, wave after wave, this huge wave smashing against it, buildings getting destroyed, ethereal tentacles coming out of the ground and, and ripping it apart. And it destroyed the entire, you know, the Black Death destroyed all of the styes, killed hundreds of people, and and you know, like all of the were rats are like swimming off. And the characters are all standing there like, wow, well, you know, that was crazy. And they saw. So then they went back to so they they defeated. That was the end of the styes as the styes got destroyed, which I thought was pretty cool. I kind of like ending on a great big, great big destruction thing like that. So then they went back to Salt Marsh and they met with uh, all of their contacts in Salt Marsh. They found out that Zolek, the vampire that they have released, who is who is kind of sort of controlling Salt Marsh, but not really. He's sort of like a vampire on vacation, and he is totally obsessed with the fact that he found the Tomb of Horrors underneath his tower, and he's just sitting there and studying all these books and old scrolls and tomes, and he's like, this place exists in different worlds. It's not just here, and the gods don't see it. You know, there's all these kind of interesting things about this tomb, you know, and I've heard stories about entire planets who got devoured by the creature that's inside of this thing. And, you know, like, but he's like, I'm scared to open it. I'm scared to open it. I'm scared to go in it. You know, there's, there's bad things in there. I don't know what's in there, but he's fascinated by it. And he's like, he looks decrepit, right? So now he's, instead of being this nice formal vampire guy, now he's kind of like falling apart and his hair's hanging down his face and he's gaunt and he hasn't eaten anything. And the characters who don't like Zolak are like, you know, they're looking at each other like, this is our shot. Like, he's not paying any attention at all to us. And we could totally gank him. So, you know, I don't know, but they're, they, they haven't decided to do that yet. So they left, and now they're getting ready to uh, board the Sea Ghost and head off into the Black Ocean in order to, to find the, the um, uh, what's it called? The city, the... the uh, the endless nadir and the rift that exists in the, uh, the the ocean floor. So, and that is where we are beginning, uh, which is the um, day rip Dave literally ripped in half. Yes, rest in peace did in half. So, um, yeah. So they're beginning in this in in salt marsh. And they're getting ready to head off into uh, head off into the ocean. Uh, how do the players take the character deaths? So every time I kill char characters in games, there's this dead silence. And there's that initial like, oh, and everybody kind of looks. And I try to play it off. And I'll describe it like, you know, you're torn in half, you know, in half your body. And like the rest of you look and your friend Dave is lying there in half. And they're like, oh. Now, the good bit was neither of them had died until it was close to the end of the fight anyway. They both had some pretty effective stuff that they did. So they... Um, they weren't too upset and honestly they got resurrected and stuff like that, but they still have like lingering effects. I think Dave is going to have this sort of, sort of abolithic connection that maybe isn't really cured. Like he could probably cure it with a greater restoration, but maybe it helps him too. So maybe we'll start with that. Dave's, uh, 
what is it called? Uh, Dave's uh, uh, disease, affliction. Here's the call of the monolith. Uh, legendary action official says, the Abolith seems pretty weak at a glance. It is a little weak. Uh, they are not the strongest. And a lot of people will argue that the, the power of an Abolith is in what it does outside of combat, not what it's doing inside of combat, right? So, so the things that make it particularly effective in combat is if people do get close, it'll beat them up with these tentacles. Uh, and as legendary actions, so it can, it's, as a melee fighter, it's pretty strong. Uh, one thing is it does not have legendary resistance, but I, as a legendary creature, I don't see any reason in not giving it legendary resistance and cheating. Um, and the tail swipe, it, like it can theoretically hit somebody three times with a tail attack and then three times with a tail swipe. And the tail swipe is 15 damage. So that's 45 damage during legendary actions plus 36 damage during regular attacks. So that's a lot of damage to be able to dish out in a single round. The, uh, the enslave is pretty powerful. And I think the enslave would be particularly good used against characters outside of combat right um and or or friends of the character npcs of the characters you know that that to me but it can it can work too particularly if the if the abolith is in a position where it's hard to reach like when it's surrounded by a control water and stuff like that and then the um layer actions so phantasmal force is a weird one you you, you know that's one where you, you better have an idea about what's going on i have a hard time understanding how to run phantasmal force so i didn't like that one uh the pools of water 90 feet on the ground, 20 feet pool must succeed. DC would pull 20 feet into the water and knock prone. The Abolith can't use the layer action until it's used a, a different one. Um, that one's not bad. Uh, I like this extra damage. You know, that like that to me, this is always a straightforward one. Anybody can see within the water uh, takes uh, seven 2d6 psychic damage. You could increase this too if you, if you really want to, you know, shake up your non, the characters who aren't in combat, like the ones who are far away hitting them with, you know, 46 psychic damage as a lair action can, can shake them up too. So, you know, there's some damage. I mean, I, I tend to, I'm a, I'm a lazy DM as we know. And to me, the laziest way to make a creature threatening is increase its damage. So when you increase this damage, uh, the psychic drain, this one's a little, because it has to be against a charmed creature, that's not particularly great. You know, you could even remove that condition and have it do it against anyone, particularly with the fact that it costs two actions. So um, it's a little weak and it's lo low on hit points for this challenge rating because if you have a bunch of people that Nova, you know, if you have you know, your paladin and your, and your fighters and everything and they're using action surges and they're using um, um, smites, you know, 135 is three hits. So um, yeah, it can, it can be killed quickly. You could of course increase this, the, the hit points out to the maximum, which would be 100 or 216 points. And that certainly helps. So those are, those are options as well. But, but mostly it's like, it's what the Abolith, an Abolith is a good villain that does things off screen. So it's good to have like, like screwing with the characters. I, I'll tell you what I wish I had done. And what I wish I had done, I forget what they call it. Uh, the false Hydra it's called. So there's a, um, uh, I think it's this article here written about six years ago about the false hydra we're going to stick this in the show notes here um uh, i think it's a zelda monster i'm not even sure where the false hydra comes from and this is sort of lore focused so it doesn't really get into like what it what it means but the idea behind a false hydra as a villain this is a very long article it goes on and on and on yeah see that's like a zelda dude um and the concept behind a false hydra uh is that it's a monster who devours not only a creature but also the memory everyone's memory of that creature and uh uh so obtuse angelo says i've researched it and uh the entire concept came from that article okay so maybe it's not a zelda thing so the the, the idea behind um a false hydra is that um uh, you have a creature that's hidden away underneath a place like the styes and the creature slowly devours other creatures and but when it devours them the memory of that creature also disappears from the world so that means you might for example have it summon the son of a king right and the king's son 
hears about a monster that lives underneath the castle. So he goes down deep into these ancient caves beneath the castle and he finds this creature and he, and the creature devours him. And now the king doesn't remember ever having a son. And the people around the town are like, no, the king's never had a son. And you're like, well, what, who's that statue? Like, there's a statue of the king with a boy. And you're like, oh, I don't remember who that was. Some villager or something. I don't know. Maybe he put a crown on it. I don't really remember. So they don't have any any memory of the of the creature, even though there are physical signs that that person. Well, like there's a bedroom right here, and it's been used recently. Oh, I think that was a guest room, you know. And they will their minds will sort of fill in other alternatives. Now the interesting thing is, what if the characters, you know, it, it's sort of a detective thing, and then like you know, the, they they might have an innkeeper, right? And the innkeeper is like, oh yeah, no, you know, sure, they're, right, the castle, but no, he never had a son. And he's like, yeah, I got to go down to my, you know, I've been having trouble in the basement. I'm going to go deal with that. And then the innkeeper disappears and they come back and there's no innkeeper. And they're like, wait a minute, who runs this place? Oh, well, we just sort of run it communally. Like all the people, they run it, you know? I'm like, but doesn't somebody maintain him? And it says like Agram's innkeeper, you know, Ag Agram's in. They're like, oh, we just made that name up. Like there isn't really an Agram. And they're like, we saw him yesterday. And it's like, no, nah, there's nobody here. So the hard part is why do the characters remember? Um, why do the characters remember that this thing existed? And, and the players will certainly remember it, but you know, can the players role play that their character forgot? And you could say things like, you don't have any memory of that guy, right? And so you could sort of play off the meta by the players know that things have changed, but the characters haven't. So to me, running it in the styes, the styes would have been a great place to have an abolith who is slowly converting the people of the styes into his uh, sea creatures, into like deep scions and... Uh, into sea spawns and stuff. And every time they are converted, the memory of them disappears in everyone else. The abolith sort of, you know, shoots out the psychic wave that sort of erases them from everyone's brain. And so you could have like a council member of the styes that everybody remembers. And then it's like, no, there's only been three. There's never been four council members. There's only been three council members. Or, you know, oh yeah, what about that priest? That priest, he disappeared, right? Or he's not, there's no priest. You never met a priest. It's like, didn't we meet a priest when we come up with the docks? It's like, no, no. When you came up with the docks, they were just, there was a bunch of thugs hanging out there. And like, no, the thugs were beating up a priest. Like, no, no, there was no priest. And then the players are like, wait a minute, something's really going on here. And then the mystery of like, what is erasing our brains, right? Like something is changing our brains. And that would be a fun way to run an abolith. So uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to, when I write the article about this, I'm definitely going to write about, I wish I had done it that way. I'm very sad that I didn't. And I think it would have been great fun to run it that way. And someday I'm going to do it. Someday I'm going to run it in another game. Next time I run an Abolith, the Abolith is going to be run that way. But it's a long, you know, that's a long game, right? You're playing the long game there because you've got to, you got to know that that's going on. Now, of course, I knew there was an Abolith underneath the styes. And I just kept putting out hints of this ancient evil that lists there. And that's pretty, you know, boring. But better would have been this idea of, of, the, of the false Hydra, um, which I think is a really, a really neat idea. So, so that's what I would do if I were running the styes. Um, but let's talk about it. Let's talk about Tomarot's fate. So because my players pick the styes first, they are now going to Tomarot's fate. And my first, uh, the first thing, the first qualifier of many is that, uh, I am not really running Tomarot's fate as written, uh, Tomarot's fate. So let's just do a quick skim of what Tomarot's fate is about. So Tomarot's fate is about a hermit, an, uh, a hermitage that's sitting on an Island called Firewatch Island. And there's a, ghost ship filled with evil ghost uh, 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 ghost pirates that regularly go and kill everybody up on the uh, island. And the characters are sent to the island to kind of find out why people haven't showed up. And when they get there, they get stuck in a, you know, the whole thing is um, they get stuck in the hermitage and they have to fight off all of the uh, uh, pirates. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in the adventure itself. Oh, and the, and the, 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 um, the pirate captain, uh, Sergal, uh, is a uh, sorcerer pa pirate captain, and he was a worshiper of Orcus, which is why they're all undead. So, and you can already tell where I'm going to change some of this stuff. So, uh, yeah, and there's a whole, there's like, you know, here's an encounter in the beginning where you get attacked by harpies. Uh, there's, you know, there's a whole village, the village of Uskar Uskarn. Well, you don't need a village of Uskarn. And they're like, hey, look, council members. It's like, oh, my God, it's a third village with council members. You know, hey, look, six more people to worry about. So instead, you just set it outside on and, 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 and remove the village and put it right by uh, Salt Marsh and, and you're all set. And then, you know, there's getting to uh, the island and there is these you know, monstrous uh, periton. Uh, and then you get to Firewatch Island and you get to this 
you know, and then the whole thing is supposed to be like defend the hermitage from the attacks. And, um, uh, I'm not using any of that. And then there's like a whole bunch of places that you, that you defend. And then I think when you're done, there's like a phase three, there's sort of a third section of this. This is all description of the hermitage and all that. There's a third wave where you actually go down into the, um, there's a whole, this whole thing. It's a relatively long adventure. Death from the deep. So then, you know, you get attacked. This is really where things go in. A bunch of hordes of undead attack and, you know, more undead attack. And then you're safe by day. And then you can actually go to the Tomorat. You go down under the ocean and you get to the Tomorat and there's this rift that's by the Tomorat that is a portal to Orcus's realm. So, you know, and then you can seal up the rift, you know, uh, it has the, the area's dark hollow effect. I think that's pretty cool. We're going to take that and you can seal it up, you know, sovereign glue or whatever. And, um, and there's this pit of hatred. And then there's a bunch of extending the adventure where you can you now have this sort of whole Orcus based adventure that's set on the sea and that that's not the only rift that there's a whole other pit of hatred is one example of the sigils that Orcus can use. Uh, and you know, other isles of bones that are entire islands that are just made out of bones. Um, so they, these are pretty cool. You know, these are pretty cool things. So it's, it's a great big adventure, but the reality is I'm, I'm, I think I am at best going to use some of the monsters and I'm going to use the name, the, the, a little bit of the story and the Tomrod and Prince Sergal and all that, but I'm throwing away almost everything else. And we're going to go with our own stuff that fits the campaign that I'm running. And, um, you know, so it's less useful for people who want to play Tomrod's fate on their own. Cause I think it could play well on their own, but you know, the reality is the kind of, the kind of D and D game I want to run is not that uh let's see a quick update on the impact on, uh oh yeah thanks yeah I, I did i did was able to give out some copies of uh return of the lazy dungeon master to some some schools uh thank you for that so uh let's see wow somebody here from spain man global audience today um so uh, there are a few things, one, one other thing to consider. So there's, there's running Tom Roth's fate, but then there's also like, this is the last adventure of this campaign. And then we're going to go to Eberron and my players are super eager about Eberron. They all like, whenever I look over at them while we're playing, they're like sneaking their Eberron book and like reading about classes and stuff in Eberron. So they're real excited about, about playing in Eberron. So we're ready to be done, but I've got a few things that I want to, uh, that I want to finish off. Uh, we're going to stick them right in here and it's like a uh, final adventure checklist. Right, and uh, we will start as we do. Uh, let me switch over to the other side. Um, we're going to start by going through the characters, uh, as we do every time we are. Whenever you are in doubt about what you should do to prep for your D&D game, start with the characters. Who are they? What do they want? What are they getting? And what's sort of their? So, so in this case, it's really important because uh, I want to. I want to. I want to tie together their loose ends. So we have Mac the Goliath. Goliath Goliath Grave Cleric, smuggler from Monmerg, worshiper of Weejoss, uh, worked for Anders Solmar, and uh, former smuggler for the Black Spire Conf Confederacy, which broke up, served on the Lady's Grace with Thurvin. And the Lady's Grace, uh, so we already have a secret, right? Which is, uh, the Lady's Grace was one of the ships in, uh, Uh, Lady's Grace, Max ship, uh, was one of the ships in Sergal's fleet. That is a secret we're going to go with. Uh, we have Blessed Sunspire, Human Paladin of Procan, Ink Black Whale, Later Parents. Uh, so her hook definitely is uh, facing off against the Black Death. So the, uh, she has to face off against the Black Death. Um so that's definitely a hook. Uh, she is also, um, they have to make a choice. Uh, face Zolek. They might have to do something with Zolek. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Um, and I think the blade, um, I'm going to throw this in front of her and we'll see if she takes it. That when they get to the Endless Nadir and they want to seal off the rift 
that goes to the realm of Tharzadun, Bless's sword is going to say, we need to go in there. We need to face him directly. And will Bless do it? And I think the sword will let her do it willingly. It won't try to force her to do it. I need a drink. Did I incorporate potions of domination when running Aboleths? I did not. I don't remember what those were about. You have to remind me about those. Um, Skyler, Aracoker Storm Cleric, knows Welgar Brainhand, Save Blath. I don't know that he has much of a hook here that I need to tie into, so we'll see. Uh, I might ask, like, is are there any hooks for your characters? But the player tends not to worry about such things like that. Uh, same thing with Corval, Thorzadun. Um... I think that the or so he's definitely got this. Yeah, he might be called. He might be called to become a champion of Tharzadun. We'll see. Uh, we have Dave. Uh, Dave is becoming. Um. He's becoming a um, a sea spawn, and he needs to get that cured. Uh, I'm not sure how that'll go. We'll see. Uh, that's probably a secret, right? Um, he's turning into a sea spawn and deep scion. Um, what's he gonna do about that? I don't know. So uh, Dave is definitely wants to, um, he knows about the Endless Nadir and he wants to seal it. So facing off against the Black Death. Um, sealing the Rift in the Endless Nadir. Uh, we definitely want to have a pirate battle, right? Against the Tomorat and Sergal. Um, you know, so, so, uh, big thing, uh, this is actually not something that that's not a really a final, a final, this is really a campaign checklist. Like what are the loose ends? So face the black death. Oh, uh, destroy. So there's an island, a strange twisted island, and upon that island is an ancient monolith, and the monolith is sort of a piercing of Tharzadun that existed in the world and acts like a beacon, and they need to destroy it. And I don't know how. Like, I don't know how. It's it's like a 50-foot high monolith. It's not like you could just beat it with a hammer and it's eventually destroyed. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work. So I have to think about that. So I think that that's really like, you know, the Corvell is being called as a champion. That's more of a... I'm going to get rid of that. Um, I guess I'm going to have my character hooks. Actually, why don't I just put it in a character section? Uh, Thar is Dune. I keep pronouncing it wrong. Uh, Splash... So I'm adding that into character stuff. Uh, face off the web, get there that. So we have a face off against the Black Death. We have a potential face off against Zolak, but that's really a final thing. And I don't know if we're gonna end up getting there. Uh, they have to go uh, get to the monolith on the island. Um, we definitely wanna have a pirate battle. And then they have to seal the rift at the endless the deer. So those are sort of the big beats that I want to run for the remainder of this campaign. Um, so uh, where are we going to, you know, I don't know how all of this is going to play out. I think the, uh, the pirate ship battle would make sense on the way. It seems like a, a general outline of this could be uh, pirate ship, uh, on the way there, Island as part two and uh, Endless Nadir as part three. Um, that could be that could be interesting. 
Oh, and then when would the Black Death show up? Would that be... Uh, when should they face the Black Death? So they could face the Black Death at the Endless Nadir. I don't know. I know they have to do that with the Endless Nadir. Um, so concealing the Rift depower the Monolith. Yeah, it could. Um, yeah, and maybe they they just can't get rid of it. But then what's the point in going to the island? Um, I mean, they're going to get to the island because that's the island is sort of a a, a, a C shaped, you know, island, and it's in the bay between the you know, it's sort of in the bay underneath it that drops down a couple thousand feet, and that's where the rift is, uh, and the uh, the island is sort of this you know piled around it. So it's a it's a cleft in the in the island that leads down that deep, and they could see the monolith, and the 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 island is filled with tools, right? Um, The island is filled with jewels. Uh, I think there is another Abolith who is not an enemy. Um, I need a cool Abolith name. Let's, uh, let's go to names. Names. Um, let's go with Indigo. Indigo. Habaleth of a pod that went against um, Sogoth. Um, that could be one. Uh, we could have a crazy wizard um the rain mate the rainmaster taran rainmaster uh who is a crazy wizard uh who has a um uh apparatus of qualish uh and explores the area And he's been twisted by the the thing, by the by the um, by the the, the call of Tharzadun. But I don't know that he's outwardly hostile. We'll see. Um, uh, what else? Um. So let's see. Uh, do I want them to face the black? I, th I think facing the black death, they could face it a couple of times, right? Like maybe they face it on the way. Boy, I could really like throw the, chick the, the chicken sink, throw the kitchen sink at them, and they are sailing off. They get attacked by Tom Rot's fate on the way. Uh, by Tom, yeah, the Tom Rot's fate, the ship. They battle against the ship, and it and maybe it sinks. Well, we'll see. They they face the ship. They face they they face Sergal and the thing. Um, they get to the island. They find the rift. Maybe, yeah, maybe they don't have to do anything with the monolith. I don't know. Uh, and then they go down and they seal off the rift and and they face the Black Death again. So maybe the Black Death is around during the pirate fight, and maybe they have to deal with it during the pirate fight. But if they wound it, it kind of goes down because it's sort of confused too, right? The 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 creature is is um is confused as well um uh and what does it want it just wants the rift but it will it, it wants the rift to con to continue to open um you know that can definitely be a uh that, that, could, that definitely could be a way to go so um so that's kind of the things that i want to um yeah, let's see. Uh, maybe a ritual of, of purification or something to banish the monolith. They got to defend against the forces of Tharzadun. Then they can the, the splinter. Yeah, so like a ritual. I'm probably, you know, destroying the monolith. Uh, requires a powerful ritual. Uh, it'll take time and it'll drive the chules bananas. 
So that'd be, kind of, that'd be a fun sort of encounter. It's destroying the monolith. Um, the monolith is a beacon to bring... Uh, let's see. It's a beacon to bring living creatures to the rift, so it needs to be destroyed uh, in order to stop, you know, the, the 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 danger of this thing, to stop the storms, uh, to stop the uh, the storms. Uh, the monolith must be destroyed, and the rift must be closed. So that could be like a vision, right? This is your quest. Um, he hears the call of the monolith, uh, learns its secrets, uh, great, huge storms start slamming salt marsh, ships are sinking. Is there any direct threat? Do we, is there any like initial fight that we want to start with? Um, I could have a bunch of uh Tharzadun cult fanatics um so if a bunch of cult fanatics attack the characters right and they're like you are the only ones who can stop our god and we want him to show up and we love storms and lo we love anything that's like purple lightning um and he attacks um how many cult fanatics is appropriate for uh, five eighth level characters? Uh, so let's, I, I put it up here because I'm just writing articles. Uh, the Sly Flourish official lazy encounter building guidelines say, choose a number of monsters that make sense. Choose a monster that makes sense. In this case, cult fanatics. These are empowered. Because of the storm, these aren't just normal cultists. They are cult fanatics. They are able to cast spells and do stuff. Um, He's not your problem, says 10. I think you are correct. I think 10 is about right. Because uh, 5 times 8 is 40, right? Divided by 2 is 20. And the challenge rating of the cult fanatic, uh, I think they're, are they CR2? Cult fanatics are CR2. So you are correct. 10 cult fanatics uh, are enough. But I think we're going to go with eight because we're not going to go, we're not going to make it too threatening. So, um, and, and, and 10 is a lot. 10 just doesn't. So I think eight of them is about right. Uh, eight. Tharzadun, cult fanatics attack the characters. So I uh, will put that in. I'll see how I feel when I'm, when I'm running. But that's a, that's a pretty strong start. So uh, final prep. The final preps to head out to sea. Um, a ship battle. Um, and uh, reaching the island. Destroying the monolith. Heading down. So reaching the island. Uh, meeting. They're going to meet. Uh, uh, meet in Inigo, not Inigo, uh, Taran. Tar meet Taran Rainmaker. Destroy the monolith. Head down to the endless. Face the Black Death. Seal the rift. So there's like a loose outline, I think, of kind of all of the main scenes that will occur before the end of this adventure and the end of this campaign. Of course, as you can see, I'm keeping them loose. Two, three, four words, three, four words, just to keep my own head around what is going on. Um, I think that that is probably uh, appropriate. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. So we're going to just jump right down to secrets. Um, I have the Lady's Grace. Uh, let's see. Uh, Uh, Sergal is a, he's, what, what is he? Sort of a resurrected, 
Yeah, follower of Tharzadun, right? Um. Uh, what else? What other? I wonder what other dangers are around. I guess, boy, down down deep is when we can bring out some really so creatures, not of this world, exist around the endless. Right. So this is where you really get your crazy like. Um, monsters from your uh, uh, Toma beasts, like the star spawns. This is a good. I think there's a. Isn't there a star? Are there star spawns in? They have these. Yeah, they have these star spawn guys. These would be pretty good. Uh, they're pretty tough too. Look at CR ten. Whoa, two slam attacks, grasping arms. I think it's time to bring some star spawns in. Right, I think this fits. I think star spawn are good creatures here. Larva mage, plague of worms. Um, oh, star spawn larva mage is a legendary. Whoa, CR 16 legendary. Oh, this one's badass. Look at this guy. These are more than caning creatures, I'm pretty sure. Seers. Yeah, this is the sad one. They don't have they don't have um, pictures of these guys. Um, they're all pretty tough. Real tough. Grues aren't so tough. So we got a lot of grues. Um, Fanged and lipless, the ever-grinning, mad, staring Gru lopes about on spindly legs and long arms, bristles and spines. This is a good one. Boy, you know what we're going to do. Aura of Madness. Creatures within 20 feet of the Gru that aren't aberrations are disadvantaged on saving throws as well as attack rolls against creatures other than a star spawn Gru. Hmm. Confounding bite. Um... Might be fun to run a horde of star spawn grooves on the island. So star spawns, I'm gonna put those down in the monsters. Uh, star spawns. Those are some good ones. Um, what else? That might be fun on the island. Uh, Gru would be a great to throw out as a bunch of minions. Yeah, exactly. I think I think uh, you know. 40 or 50 grues, great big hordes of them crawling over. That way it's not just chules. Like you could put chules, but maybe I'll replace some of those with the, the like star spawn creatures. You know, like there'll be chules, but there'll be these other sort of twisted twisted horrors. Um, I think that fits. I think that the star spawn being from sort of Tharzadun's realm, you know, is really, they're, like, they're not demons. They're not devils. They're not, they don't have any connection to the to the human or to, to the mortal uh, mortal planes. You know, they're just vicious. Uh, how many? I have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I need two more secrets. Oh, what other secrets exist down there? What's going on in the depths? Uh, the monolith is half a million years old. Uh, as are the creatures around. As are the creatures around it. Um, the aboliths are responsible for the, for the tear. The rift is growing exponentially. Um, it's been growing for... It's been growing for thousands of years, but now we'll tear open in just a few days and devour and devour the whole sea. That's how exponentials work. Big zoop. Um, those are pretty good. Uh, NPCs, I got a couple. I don't think I need many more. I have so many NPCs. I'm not going to worry about this. Um, hey, Mr. Dory's dead. Uh, fantastic locations. So I think uh, the back of um, 
the back of uh, uh, sh of ships in the sea, back of Ghost of Saltmarsh, I think has ship boats, uh, ship. St it's got stats, but I think it's also got some nice maps. Does it have a great big sailing ship? Yeah, so here's a good sailing ship. That's not bad. Here's a warship. That's what we're going to use. So let's... Uh, I think if I had... Um, if I had thought, I would have printed... I don't think I printed these out. Maybe I did. I might have printed these out. I don't think I did. But it would have been worth doing. Um, whoops. It's got a lot of ship upgrades and stuff. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I could have done more with that. There's so much stuff in this book um, that you can, that you can work with that I didn't really work with. Um, So I don't know, like it would be great. I might, I, I think I've got some maps upstairs of ships. So I think I'm gonna hit those up when I leave for the game and, and, and use those. Um, I think that will work. Uh, I haven't been carrying around. I also have the, um, the sea ghost. So we'll have to, you know, I think I'll put both maps out and, and we'll see how that goes. Yeah, so let's see. Uh, Tom Rott's Fate, uh, The Island. Obviously, it has uh, the monolith. Uh, the Deep Caves, which are these like, weird slimy caves that um, uh, is like the spawning grounds of these things. These like, you know, they're like half in and half out of reality. Uh, the ruins. There's an old temple there that's ruined. I'm not going to really do much with it, but it's there. I think that'd be cool for the island. And then uh, I think probably next week we'll worry about what's in the Endless Nadir. Because it's, uh, it's going to have like sea elven ruins. It's going to have uh, abolithic. And I'm probably going to steal a lot of this from other books that I've done. Um, Fantastic Locations has a bunch of stuff for this, and um, uh, Fantastic Adventures Ruins of the Grendel Root has a bunch of stuff I can steal from. So I think we're, we're, we're good there. Uh, I think for the pirates, I'm just going to use thugs as generic pirates. And they can be undead or anything else. Thugs are great. I think they're one of my favorite stat blocks. Uh, oh, and I was going to use uh, Cult Fanatics. So I think that is pretty well set um um what else i'm good on treasure except the i think the apparatus of qualish will be a good piece of treasure i don't know that i'm gonna throw much other treasure at them i think they're all pretty good so yeah i feel all right about this you know, I think this is one, particularly for pirate battles and stuff, it would have been nice to spend a little bit more prep time. Uh, what about bandits? Yeah, bandits are good too, and you can hurl a lot of bandits, but um, and then maybe, I'll, yeah, thugs and bandits, right? And then these are like, you know, pirate thugs, right? Um, let's take a look at this. So there's actually, I said I was going to use the stat blocks from um, Tom Roth's Fate. Uh, da, 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 sources, adventures, ghosts, uh, Tom Rott's fate. Because uh, there's a whole bunch of different monsters that are in Tom Rott's fate that are custom. And I just want to take a look and see what those are like and if we, if we dig them. Uh, if not, we'll just reskin stuff. Uh, I'll tell you, man, invisible stalkers, no one likes invisible stalkers. 
this adventure might work perfectly well on its own too. I just don't, you know, I know that for me closing up a campaign, I'm not going to run it as it, as it is. I've heard people who ran it as a standalone and that it worked really well. So we have drowned ascetics. Uh, CR 375. Um, these are like monks. Uh, drowned blades, CR2s. Blue rot. These guys might be fun. So I think I'm going to throw the drowned guys on the ships. Uh, you know, that they would be fun. Um, drowned assassin. Uh, blue rot. Nasty. Um, yeah, these are kind of neat. Uh, drown blaze around the And then do they have, I guess those are the, the drown types of those three. And then uh, is there Sergal? Drowned Master. 157 CR9. Life draining tentacle. This guy looks pretty cool. Cold Aura. Ooh, I love auras. Whoa. Two great sword attacks. 10 slashing damage plus 14 cold damage. Wow, 24 points of damage on each hit. Vicious. Life Draining Tentacle. Life Draining Tentacle drains 10 hit points. That's nasty. Necrotic Ink. Nice. Drown Master. So I thought he was supposed to be like a sorcerer, but I don't see any doing sorcerer stuff. That's pretty cool. So I like the drowned guys. They're 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 cool. So these are like powerful undead, um, you know, powerful undead walkers, right? And we're gonna steal this the rift here with that. It's got a dark hollow effect, right? When we get closer to that. Oops. Cancel. So I think we're all set. So that is it for today. Uh, I think I've got enough to go with here. I think we're I think we're okay. I feel a little unprepared. Um, uh, yeah, youth begat this stupidity uh, asks, "What is the endless nadir?" The endless nadir in my version of this, and I think it's in the styes. I think they talk about it in the styes is an abolithic city that exists on the sea floor. Uh, it was taken over by sea elves at one point and then taken over by Sahu again, and then they all abandoned it. And the idea is that when the Abolists created this underwater city, uh, one of them, this is my story, not necessarily what's in the book, uh, one of them, a, a Abolith named Sogoth, uh, they used a channeled sea elf to... Uh, they found this like meteorite that had glyphs on it and they traced the meteorite the glyphs into the ground and it opened up a tear in the ground and the tear leads to the realm of Tharzadun and it possessed Sogoth and he became a priest of Tharzadun, an abolithic priest of Tharzadun. He ended up murdering his other two abolithic friends, friends, whatever, colleagues, work, you know, friends from work. And um, he uh, then became this priest and the rift has been growing. So in the Endless Nadir, which probably now has a hole that's, I don't know, it's probably 30 or 40 feet wide and it's growing like it's just you can see it just eating away around the outer edges. And um, it's you know, surrounding it is this abolithic city that was also you know, has been down there for like a half a million years. So, um, yeah, so that's what the Endless Nadir is. It's a great underwater abolithic city that the characters are going to go to in order to face off against the Endless Nadir. So we will see how that goes. 
Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, I always appreciate having folks in the chat come and hang out while I'm preparing for my D&D game. I hope you found this useful. And I will see you guys. Uh, let's see. No. So I will not be having a show next week because I will be at Winter Fantasy. So, um, yeah, there will be no Barandar and Bing and there will be no uh, Lazy DM Prep. So uh, my game is today. It's in an hour. Uh, so I will talk to you guys later. Thanks you all. Thank you all again for coming and get out there and play some D and D.